basically talking about plenty today. I want this to be a conversational type presentation. There's no slides. We're just going to dive into the code and take a look. And if you have questions, just let me know. We can just like hash out some of the details of how Plenty is implemented. So I, I named this behind the scenes with Plenty and I thought it might be interesting to kind of pull back the curtain and see what we're doing behind the scenes. So people who are interested in Svelte or Go or deploying things, they can kind of get the brass tacks of how we're doing that. So you could either use it in your own projects or if you're interested in contributing and getting involved with Plenty, you'll have at least a base knowledge about what we're doing and how we're approaching some things. Feel free to ask questions, of course. Sure. Now. I just want to ask, does everybody see Jim's uh, computer or his desktop? Because I cannot see it. Oh, I can see it. I can, can see it. I can see it. It just says desktop right now. Um, OK. I, yeah. yeah, I'm having some issues. OK. Proceed. <laughs> I think it's going to be easiest to just start with a, a plenty project. So I'm going to do plenty new site. And we can call it whatever. I'll call it AAA. And when you create a site, it creates it pretty fast, as you see. So the scaffolding was created, it gives you a little help about how to get started. So basically, you enter into the project folder, and then you can start a server. So I'm just going to enter in my project folder here. And then I'll open that project up in a text editor. Now, can you see my text editor here? Yeah? OK. I'm assuming people can see it. If you can't, let me know. Yes. Yes. OK. Um, great. So, so Plenty is a, I like to start by like showing exactly what this is and talking about what it is in case there are people who aren't familiar, but Plenty is a static site generator. Now, what you do with a static site generator is you can build these Jamstack sites and hopefully you're familiar with the term Jamstack, but if you're not, they're basically sites that you can compile once and then you can deploy them on a server where you don't have to worry about any of the backend of the server. So you don't have to manage things like databases or programming languages. Uh, so Plenty actually doesn't need Node.js or Go or anything on the system in order to run it. Um, and it gives like a really simple way to get back to web development. Now, you can't do as much with a, a Jamstack as you can maybe with a full stack thing unless you integrate microservices, but it makes the process of designing and building front-end websites a lot easier. So it's just a different way of thinking about building your websites. Now, um, let me see here. So when we talk about Plenty, and I have my notes here, uh, we, we talk about it being a Go and a Svelte SSG. Now, I think that confuses a lot of people. So a question that we often get is, do I need to know how to use Go in order to use Plenty? And you really don't. So like the only time Go comes in is when you're, we're building the engine that basically you're using to build Plenty sites. And if you're interested in that kind of process, then Go knowledge is helpful. But if you're the user of Plenty, so if you're using the static site generator, you really don't need to know much about Go at all. Um, it's going to be kind of hanging out in the background. And you actually don't even need Go installed on your computer because Go is a compiled language. So basically, once it compiles, it builds a binary that you can download. And it runs without the actual runtime of Go on your computer at all. So um, it's a little different than something like PHP or JavaScript or Ruby, which you actually need installed on your computer in order to run those programs. So it's just a little different way of thinking. Um, another question you might ask is, do I need to know how to use Svelte? And now that's something that's definitely helpful. And I, I highly encourage you to take a look at Svelte if you haven't taken a look at it. It's a, a really low barrier to entry framework that lets you do really dynamic things. But you can probably even get away with using Plenty without having a ton of Svelte knowledge because Svelte actually looks a lot like a standard HTML and CSS framework. And you basically feel like you're just writing regular HTML, CSS websites. And then you can kind of sprinkle in JavaScript where you want it to be interactive. And it's really intuitive. And they, they take a lot of like the boilerplate and the confusing concepts out of that, that ecosystem and make that process a lot easier. So you really can get started with Plenty and Svelte without knowing much about any of those concepts. So um, to get started, you can basically install it the same way you would with any other software through your package manager. So if you're on Linux, you might use something like Snapcraft or Snap. If you're on Mac, maybe use something like Homebrew. And on Windows, although we've, the support for this is, uh, is a little bit wonky at the moment, but you can use Scoop, which is a package manager there. And we're actually recommending that people use uh, something called WSL, which is Windows Subsystem for Linux. So newer versions of Windows, so Windows 10 and above, um, I don't know if, I don't know what the, the minor version releases for Windows are, but um, those come with a, a Linux kernel in the back end. So you can actually use a, a Linux-like environment on your Windows computer. And uh, I think that's probably the better way to go because then you get access to like 
Unix-like command line syntax. And I think it's just a, it's a better development environment, especially if you're coming from Mac or Linux or something like that. So we recommend using WSL if you're going to get started with Plenty. So let's just pop in here and let's take a, a quick look at, at Plenty, right? So I'm in a Plenty project. Um, these are the, the folders and files in here. You can basically start up a web server by running Plenty Serve. And you see that it builds your site down here. And then you get this little local host link here that you can come and let me see, I'm just gonna copy this. And I'm going to open this in Firefox. So you get a website, it looks like this. And basically it, this is the default starter that is helping give you some context about how to navigate plenty and where things are. So you'll notice at the bottom of each one of these pages, there are two uh, references. So one is the template and you can copy this just by clicking copy. And one is the content. So if you want to know how this page is being produced, basically this content file here, this content index.json is producing the data. And then this layout content index.svelte is producing the structure. And if you go to any one of these individual individual pages, you'll see the same thing. So we see a template here, um, this pages template, and then this pages about.json file. Um, this is pretty similar, but contact. If you come over here to the blog, you'll notice that it's the same thing. So we have this blog.svelte file is producing it. And you know, your component.json file here is uh, producing the content. So you could copy one of these and you could come over here to your project, for instance, and you could do a control P if you're using VS Code, and you could search for that route and basically open up that page to see what's going on in here. And let me just expand this a little bit so you can see what's going on. Okay, so yeah, you can see that basically there's some script information, so we're pulling in different components, but essentially it's just HTML. So you have a title here, you have a paragraph tag, um, you have a, a little loop for some paragraphs in here. And then there's some other information for some dynamic things like dynamic components, which this example is actually going over. So this is an example of dynamic components. Um, now, this example might be a little confusing. You might be thinking, well, what's a dynamic component? Is it a component that moves around on the screen like this? That's not really what we're trying to emphasize. What we're really trying to emphasize with dynamic components is it's something that you can define in your content source, and then you can pull it into your project so uh, for instance, we don't import explicitly anywhere in here, those two components. So let me just show what I'm talking about here. We have a components layout here and we have this ball.svelte and this block.svelte and those correspond over here to this bouncing ball and this rotating block. Now, if you look up here in the script, we actually don't explicitly import the ball or the block anywhere there. So we import some other things like incrementer and decrementer, we don't explicitly do that. And so what we're really doing down there is we're using this dynamic component here, this Svelte dynamic component. This is a Svelte directive. And then we're pulling in this all components object. And then we're just basically specifying that we want the name of that component and we're pulling it in it uh, dynamically. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing because uh, if you're familiar with like dynamic imports with uh, ECMAScript modules, that basically those things run asynchronously. So Although they would work on the front end, it's kind of interesting that I can reload this page and those things are still available server side. Um, and the way we're doing that is we actually are doing some pretty interesting things behind the scenes in the back end where we're creating component signatures for each one of these different layouts that are in your site. And then you can pull those in synchronously through your content source and you have those available. So for instance, if you had something like these components down here pulled in asynchronously, you could still have them produce in your static HTML in case someone was navigating your site without any JavaScript or anything like that pulled on. So um, definitely dynamic components are, are an interesting way to do it. I actually have a video series on YouTube about creating a, a theme in Plenty and we're doing everything with dynamic components. So basically we define everything we need on the page in our content source. And then we make a structure that can consume that content source and basically build out a page based on what's specified in there. And the advantage of doing that is you're not stuck into anything being hard coded. So if you ever hand this off to a client, they don't have to worry about HTML or JavaScript or imports or any of that. They basically can write content in a certain way and they'll automatically build a page structure based on that content. Now, keep in mind that this directive here, this all components directive, this is a naming convention that we may change at some point. This, uh, we actually have this release coming out, uh, the 0 0.4 release, and we're changing a lot of API things. So this is probably going to become all layout. So just keep that in mind if you're looking at this. So this go, should go over to the documentation here. This is going to change. Um, so if you're coming to this video a little later, keep in mind that that might be a little different. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
uh, so basically what we're thinking here is since Plenty is still new, we're, we're, we're changing a lot of the API still. Um, usually those changes are pretty quick. So if you created a site on the old API, it shouldn't be a big lift for you to actually go back and update it for the new API. It's usually just changing like a file name or a folder, but we're, we're trying to make things more intuitive for new users right now, since things are really in flux and we're changing the system a lot. We're, we're going with the, uh, the viewpoint that we want the new people coming on to have the best experience possible. And once we figure out all these different things as we learn and we build things over time, then we'll, we'll start stabilizing the API as we get closer to a stable 1.0 release. But until then, we, we still might change things. Of course, if you have a site that you're running and we update the API, there's two things you can do. You can always target the old builds. So we actually have a dedicated um, container. So if I look up, let's see, Plentico, um, Docker Hub. Let's see if I can get that to, um, okay. So Plentico Docker Hub. So we have this Docker Hub here where basically we have all these different releases and you can see that we have all these different tags for all the different versions. So you can target a specific tag in your CI process to build out a specific version. So even if we change things with the API, you can continue using the old API forever if you want, and you can continue building your sites. Um, if you want to update, of course, usually the changes aren't that big. Just come to us or make an issue in the issue queue, and we can discuss how you can get on the latest architecture. Um, but just keep in mind that the, the API is still in flux a little bit with some of those things changing. So great. So, um, so that talks about some of these changes. Uh, we have an issue here with those details for those changes. So if you are interested in taking a look, you can actually go to our GitHub. And actually, if you were to come to just the issues tab in here, we've pinned this at the top. So if you're interested in what's changing in the, the point four release, come in here, you can see that there's a lot of details in, in uh, comments about what we're thinking about doing. So if you have any questions and you wanna get used to it ahead of time, just go there and take a look about what's going on. Um, hopefully that won't disturb your, your process too much. Okay, so we're, we've created a new demo project here. Uh, we, this is the starter. We talked about the template exploration. I think one of the things to do now is just discuss a little bit about how routing works. So you notice that we have all these pages kind of out of a box. It's like, how, how is this working, right? So we have about pages like this. They just go off the, the base of the website. Contact page is the same thing, but then we have blogs and they appear in a subfolder called blogs. Um, and how is this all working? Now, it's it should be pretty straightforward, I hope. Basically what's happening here, and let me expand this to make the file structure a little more visible. So we have this, this content folder that has all our content sources. And each one of these has different content types. So blogs is a content type, pages is a, is a content type, and index is actually a content type as well. And basically what that means is they each get their own template. And inside there, you can have multiple pages. So components, Perry, Plentiform, stores. Now by default, every route in the system is gonna to correspond to these content files with the exception of an underscore file. This is a special name file, so don't worry about that right now. And basically what's gonna happen is the path is going to be the folder structure with the file name that's been slugified. So for instance, we have blog components. So if we were going back to the site, we have blog components here. You can see that route corresponds there. If you were to look at this one here, blog Perry, this corresponds to the folder blog and then the, the file name Perry. Now you can override those. So for instance, if we were to look at pages, you'll notice that we have a pages folder and then the, the file name here. But if we look here, there's no pages subfolder when you go to that route. Now, the way we're doing that is we're actually going to our plenty.json file. This is a site-wide configuration file. And if we were to expand this, you can see that basically um, we're, we have this types declaration. Now, this is another thing that's changing in the point four release. So this will be called routes in the future. And then what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, we want to change the path for the pages content type. We want it to just be a replacement pattern of the file name. Now, there's a couple different replacement patterns here. You can see that we have file name, we also have paginate. We could do other things as well. So for instance, let's override our blog content type. So we have a content type called blog. And let's say instead of, let's go back here. So our blog is currently living at blog and then the file name. Let's say we don't want it at blog anymore. We want it at posts. So we can hard code something like posts. Oops. And then I could do a replacement pattern uh, and I'm going to use the field replacement pattern. And let me just, quickly look at my content source. So if I look inside my blog and I take a look at one of these blog posts and if I look here, you'll see that we have a title field, body field, components field. Maybe we just wanna target the title field for now. So I'm going to say 
give me the title and do a replacement pattern on that. So now what's going to happen here is you can, with this field declaration as a replacement pattern, you can pull out any key from your content source and start using that in your URL patterns. And what this is going to do is it's going to slugify this field. So we have this field right now that has dynamic components example. It's going to you know lowercase that and put hyphens instead of spaces and slugify it. And then it's going to hard code the post here. So you're gonna get basically post and then the title name. Now, again, keep in mind API change. This will probably be called fields at the next release. Right now it's called fields. So just keep that in mind if you're doing that. And then if you save this, so I just save that. Basically what's going to happen is if I look down here, it should rebuild the site. And then if I come back to my site here and I reload it and I go to one of these pages now, you'll notice that now that lives at posts, dynamic components example. So that previously lived at blogs and then the file name, now it lives at this other URL. So you can update URLs nice and easy like that. We have these replacement patterns. There's some other ones coming as well, but that's basically how you could override some routes. Another thing that's um, kind of interesting, so we talked a little bit about the dynamic components. I know that it's kind of confusing if, if we don't dive in deeper, but I want to talk a little bit later about component signatures and things like that. So maybe we can revisit that. So I'm going to skip that for now. Another thing I want to look at is the pager. So we're already in here and you see this declaration here that's this paginate, and then it has this variable called total pages. <clears throat> now the pager works pretty cool and we can see it in action over here. So on the home page, we have a lot of blog posts. Well, we don't have a lot. We have five blog posts, right? Or four, four blog posts, it looks like. Um, there's these three on this first page, and then we have a paginated output over here to the second page. And you'll notice here that the URL updates over here to uh, just be the home page or page two. Now what's happening here is we're using the same template. We're using the home page template. And basically all we're doing is we're switching out how many posts that we're displaying here. And we're keeping track of that and we're also server rendering it. So if I reload this page on page two here, you see that we still get this second blog post here. So you could send somebody th this link. It's not like something that's just client side, it's happening that server side as well. Now, it took a lot of thought to like think about how we wanted to update some of this pagination information. And what we wanted to do is we didn't wanna force people to First of all, have any context about how Go works, right? So Go is doing your builds from your content source. And what we could have done over here is we could have said, okay, when you do a route override, make sure you point to your content source, make sure you point to how many items are in there, how many pages you want, and then use like some Go function to do that. Now we didn't want to do that. We wanted to keep people as closely, like um, you know, couple as closely to the front end as possible, not worrying much about the back end. So what we ended up doing here is we made a system where um, let's take a look at the page that's producing that. So we have our our um, our layout, we have our content, we have our index page that's producing that pager. And um, uh, actually we're, we're, sorry, I picked the wrong page there. I picked pages, I want index. And what we're doing here is, let me expand this, make it a little bigger. Um, we're We're making a pager here and we're defining all this information in our client side app. So we're, we're defining how many posts we want on each page. We're defining what kind of content we want. So for instance, we're just doing a, a simple filter here on our content type. So we're pulling our, our blog our blog content type out. There could be you know pages and other in, events and news and all sorts of content types. And then we're getting all the posts there. <clears throat> and then we're essentially saying, well, how many posts do we have in total? And we're getting the length. And then we're getting how many total pages by basically taking the total pages or the total posts and how many posts we want in each page, and I'll tell you how many pages there are. And then we're basically rounding up because if there's a you know less than a full amount of page output, you want to round up because you're still gonna have a page for that. And then what we're doing here is since we called this variable total pages, if you look over here in the index, that's the variable that you put in here. This could be anything. If we called this total posts, for instance, we would use that variable over here, and it basically is smart enough to go into uh, your build process when your site builds, it'll go in and it'll find whatever value has the total number of pages that you want to paginate, and it'll use that value. So basically at, at build time, it goes in, it does all this calculation on the front end, and it goes and it, when it finds out that information, it can then be used in your build process. So it really simplifies that. Now, you do not have to follow this build process at all. So for instance, you know, we're naming all these variables this, we're setting it to three and we're using this, and you could definitely use this template if you want it in your own process, you could just copy this but you can make your own build process. You could use any pager that you really wanna use. Um, this is just a custom one that we put in here. It's completely flexible. Any way that you could do a pager in Svelte, you could use with plenty and then basically just keep track of whatever variable 
has that total number of pages and pass it back to, uh, to, to this section here. So it offers a lot more flexibility in terms of how you want to do your paginated output. Now, um, if you want to use this example, we can show how kind of flexible this is. We can show off a couple of things here. So um, right now we have the five pages and you might be thinking, well, what's this look like when we update things? So what happens if we add more posts here and we, we go to like three pages or four pages? Um, do we have to do any manual updating? And the answer is no. So we have this set up in kind of a flexible way now. So if I come over here and I open up a new terminal and I CD into my content source, oops, content, and I go into the blog. And then I'm just going to open this up in Bash real quick because the fish shell that I was in before kind of uh, does a little funky things with, with some of these characters. But basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create 200 blog posts. So I'm going to copy this command. I'm basically using the T command to automatically copy this peri.json file that's already in our content source. And then I'm creating a new content file called post. And then I'm going to number that one through 200. So let's come over here and let's, let's do that. First of all, let me just expand this. Let me list the files in here. So you see that currently we only have these blog posts. If I go and I run that and I list these files again, you can see we now have 200 blog posts in here. Um, now let me show off a couple things. Let me go back to our site. So you notice over here, the site rebuilt and it did it in less than three seconds. So we now have you know 200 pages plus all the default content that was there. And, and we built the site pretty, pretty quick. And if I come back over here and I come and I reload this, you notice down here that, so we're printing just all the content down here at the bottom. Like you obviously wouldn't want to do this like this, but this, this is how we're doing it. Um, so now we have all these blog posts that are in here. If you look at your pager, you see that we just by, by the way that we had this pager outlined here, we have one through four, but you could keep going to the next and you can see that this just keeps scrolling for a long time. And I could go all the way to the last and you can see we have 67 pages of page, paginated output. Now there are a lot of these are using the same title because we just copy them. So if you come through here, they all look kind of the same, but this is all server rendered. So you have HTML fallback for each one of these pages. So you could reload this and those pages would work. You can click into any of these and they're all the individual blog posts there. So that, that's kind of interesting um, that you can do that without really rigging up anything else in terms of like um, just changing your content source. So you could have like a full functioning blog this way, for instance, where you set up this one time and then you just write content over time. And basically you can, um, uh, you know, just add pages to your blog that way. And it just rebuilds and automatically adds it to your source. So is that, um, I just want to show off a couple more things. And then I really want, I, I feel like I always take way too long. <laughs> I'm always slower than I think I'm going to be. Um, so I want to hop into just like some of the, the nitty gritty, like behind the scenes things. So let me just show off a couple other things. So we have um, a couple of new things. So we now have live reload. Um, you could type it in like this, flag live, if I can spell reload, or you could just pass in the L flag. And basically what that's going to do is behind the scenes here, it's going to actually let you update some of your content. So let me just come over here and let me make sure I'm on a homepage that works. Okay. So you see when I, I'm, I'm manually reloading right now, but you can see that it's connecting over here in the upper right hand corner. You see this little green that is connected. Um, and so if I were to come back here and actually take a look at like a content source, for instance, let's look at, um, let's just go to the homepage. I'm going to go to my index content source and maybe instead of welcome plenty, I'll just say we plenty and I'll save that. And you'll see here that it, um, it automatically re rebuilds. And if I, if I come over here, it's already reloaded over here. So it just automatically does. That. I don't have to go through and automatically reload that. Now this is a little different than hot reloading. So your state and things like that are not persisting. It's basically the system behind the scenes is causing a hard refresh. Um, but that I know a lot of people were looking for features like that. So that's in the newer versions of plenty. Um, some other flags that might be useful to folks. Um, sometimes you have to test things with SSL. So we have an SSL flag now. So instead of doing an HTTP localhost, you can have an HTTPS localhost. And if you come back over here and you run this and you don't have to set up any, any search or anything like this. So you don't have to mess with setting up your own search, but you have this HTTPS localhost now and you can go to advanced and accept the risks. Obviously it's not a valid search. So that's why you're getting that, but you can serve your sites over SSL uh, TLS if you want to do that. Um, there's a ton of other flags. I don't think it's really worth going into those right now. If you ever want to look at what's available to you, you can just do, uh, whatever command you want and you can run help and that'll tell you a bunch of flags. You can benchmark and you can um, change ports and things like that. If you want to run multiple plenty sites, you have to run them on different ports um, and, and things like that. So definitely explore if you're interested in more of that kind of stuff. But I think I want to 
kind of get into some backend stuff to show what, what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so I'm gonna move on. Um, some common questions here. Uh, I can briefly go over these. I could definitely go in way more detail. A lot of people ask, where's the markdown? Um, basically, right now we support a JSON content source. We probably could support markdown. I, I just really, I think about this in terms of like, um, like the strategy behind how this site is set up. And I really think of Plenty as not really a traditional static site generator in a lot of ways. It, I'm really trying to, to, to move Plenty in more of like a full feedback loop type static site generator where there is some kind of content editing that's happening on like the, the front end browser of the, the system. And then that rebuilds and it has this kind of system where you're not really thinking about editing files on your local host anymore. So you're not really going to be editing the JSON directly or the markdown. Um, so for now, we, it's not a huge priority. Maybe someday we'll, we'll introduce markdown. I know a lot of people request it, but um, I'm really thinking I wanna keep the content as structured as possible. I think it gives you a lot more flexibility on the front end. And I also wanna have this method where we're feeding from the content source to the template versus having a back and forth. Because uh, when you start introducing content, uh, like markdown content, you basically, in this weird place where you have this big unstructured blog. And so people try to get around unstructured content and markdown by introducing things like short codes. So short codes are basically these little like replacement patterns where you can sprinkle out throughout your markdown. And then they pull in like structure or logic into your content. And then you have this back and forth where like you have defined YAML that's feeding into structured HTML. And then you also are pulling in structured HTML into content. Um, and I, I think we want to think long and hard before we start having that mixed workflow. Um, I think you can actually accomplish a lot of what you want to do by feeding it one way. And if, if we make the system work really well in that way, we can provide more guidance and have a more unified experience. Now, of course, we're not there today. So the criticisms of the JSON data source are valid. And I'm not saying that where we are is perfect. It's definitely like half baked where it is now. But I really think that if we can implement what I'm talking about, it might be an easier solution for people if they start getting used to what that looks like. So um, if you disagree with me, definitely put in the comments. I like when people express their views and come up with valid points because this is definitely subject to change if, if people feel strongly one way or another. Um, so we have some questions here about like SvelteKit and Elder.js and Jungle.js and some other frameworks that are similar. Uh, th there's, this could be a really long debate, but basically um, it, it's hard to, hard to know exactly what SvelteKit because SvelteKit is not released yet. Um, but basically I think SvelteKit's actually validating a lot of things that Plenty did early on. So like introducing Snowpack, which is like an anti-bundler into the build process is something that we decided to do very early on. And I'm gonna get in a little more about how we're doing that in a second. So I think um, I'm interested to see where SvelteKit comes from or in the future, but basically I think, you know, SvelteKit's like the next JS for Svelte where basically you're hand handling some of the backend server render stuff and the Jamstack stuff. So there's a lot more that goes into it and you can definitely do a lot more with that system. But when you have something that, that handles a lot of things, uh, it you know it, it's going to have some drawbacks to a purpose-built system that's only Jamstack. So if you're doing Jamstack-specific stuff and you want a really simple static site experience, then uh, Plenty might still be a good choice. But you know, of course, we'll, we'll see more when Svelte, SvelteKit comes out, and uh, we can evaluate that a little bit more when that happens. And then when you compare it to to Jungle and Elder, I think you know these end up being very similar at the end of the day. They're all kind of Jamstack-oriented. I think basically Plenty is different in the way that we're less about the, the JavaScript ecosystem. So if you want something that's using the tools that you're very familiar with heavily and you feel like you're writing this typical JavaScript app, those those solutions might be pretty good for what you're looking for. If you're looking for something that's really just consistent and simplified, then Plenty might have some advantages there. Um, and especially with, with some of the things that we're introducing in the near future in terms of like the, the build process and integrating with headless CMSs and things, I think you might find that um, Plenty has uh, a, a great experience there that, that's going to be helpful. So um, it basically comes down to your comfort level. Like, do you want a, a traditional type static site generator or are you looking for more like a JavaScript app? And it comes down to per per uh, sorry, personal preference. So definitely take a look at all the different solutions and, and find out what, what jives with you the best. But um, if you have any questions about Plenty, of course, ask me. Um, integrating Svelte libraries. Okay, so this is, could be another conversation as well. Basically, I, I suggest pulling these things through themes and bundler uh, instead of like bundler. So a lot of these felt libraries right now, they require like roll up and webpack integrations. Uh, we might pull an ES build, which is a go bundler. We had it in the project at one point, we might integrate it more full fledged in the future, but I really think you can accomplish a lot of the same things like component libraries 
through the theme process that we've built out. So I, I kind of suggest doing that. If you're interested in Tailwind, we have a whole issue on our GitHub that describes how you can set that up and use it. Um, and then we talked about WSL a little bit, so I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so I think let's take a look at some of the, um, the, the theme stuff here real quick. And I'm just going to create a new repository. So I'm going to come down here, close out of this. Maybe I already closed out of this. Let's see here. Um, okay, I'm gonna get out of this project here. I'm gonna create a new project. So let's get out of what we just created. I'm going to delete that project and I'm going to create a new site. We'll call it the same thing, but I'm gonna pass the bear flag. And basically what that does is it creates a site scaffolding with less information. So I plenty serve, oops, uh, sorry. Actually, I wanna open this up in Codium again. And if I come down here and I plenty serve, this site is smaller, so it would actually should just start up faster in general. You see that was pretty quick. And then if we come over here and we were to look at it now, whoops, I'm not doing the HTTPS web server, but I have basically a starter that just says my plenty site. And um, with uh, with a, a default, bare default like this, you can actually integrate with themes a lot easier. So theming system is a way to basically do template inheritance. So you can point to any other pl plenty site and you can inherit the components or the content or the files or all three or just two of the three. You can basically choose how to do that. And it handles all the Git versioning and everything behind the scenes. So you don't have to worry about sub modules and things like that. So for instance, I could come in here and run a plenty theme and I could do an add command. Now what I'm doing here is I'm just basically the same way you would clone a Git repository. I'm pointing to a repository on GitHub called Plenty Themes Big Spring. And if I run that, and it runs pretty quick and it adds that information. And basically what it does is behind the scenes in your site-wide configuration, you're planning out at JSON, it adds some, some information here about your theme config. So it creates this theme config directory. And then it says the name of the folder that it added. And then it adds the uh, URL to the remote so it can pull upstream in the future. And then it gives you a little bit of the status about where it is. So this is the commit we pulled. When you don't pass any flags, basically it pulls the most recent commit, but there might be a reason why you need to pull an older commit. So say for instance, you're using a theme with an older version of Plenty and it used to work, but it doesn't work anymore. You could actually come and you could pass the commit flag like this and you could, you could pull it out at, at a certain um, place in history. Uh, so for instance, we could actually even downgrade this. So we could do the Plenty theme um, oh geez, I don't even remember the commands here. Let's let's get out of this. So if you don't remember commands, you can always do plenty theme help. And we could do an update command here. So we could do um, plenty, actually let me, I wanna get that, that commit URL because I don't wanna go to the website. Let me see, plenty theme add commit. Okay, so that's a URL for an older commit here. And I'm just going to do Update, our theme name is Big Spring. And let me see if I can get everything on the same screen here. Can I get it all down there? Uh, no, it doesn't wanna do it. Okay, um, so I'm going to basically change that commit. And although you couldn't see, I wanted to do it, but basically it will change this commit hash for you. So you can get the older version and it also changes the theme that's downloaded. Oh, I'm making a mess here. Um, it also changes the theme that's downloaded over here in your themes folder. So it changes the, the code that's in here, but you don't have to worry about sub modules. So if you're get tracking this, you can just, you know, get add the whole folder um, and you don't have to worry about it because it's all tracked out of the, the, the box here. Now, if you want to enable that theme, it's not actually enabled yet. So you just would run, you could either just manually add the folder name here. So we have this big spring folder inside our themes. You could just add that here directly to your file, or you could run the command line tool to do a plenty theme enable big spring. And that should, uh, let me see if this didn't update. Oops, oh, I don't wanna save. Okay, let's see if, okay. So that's automatically been added there. Um, so, so basically you can enable your theme that way. Um, you don't need to use a remote at all. So for instance, if you built a theme locally or you download it from Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that, you don't need to use this theme config at all. This is optional to make your upstream and updates and things like that really easy. Um, but you could delete this completely and you could just point to a, a folder that lives in your themes. 
So you could get rid of this completely if you wanted to. Um, but basically, once you pull that, you enable that theme and you specify your theme directive here, pointing to a theme. You can do a build here, but let me first, um, let me get rid of some content here and some files. So we don't want this default anymore. So I'm gonna come in here. I'm going to delete this index.json file from my base site. And I'm actually gonna also come into my layouts and I'm going to delete this whole structure here. So let me delete content and let's delete this as well. Um, and delete everything. Okay. So, and can I just delete this folder? I don't know how to do that. It's weird how, um, how VS Code puts that in there. I don't know how to just delete that second folder. So let's, let, that should be fine. Um, let's come in here and let's run a plenty build now, or sorry, plenty serve. So we can start up our local web server. Uh, it looks like we already have our web server running in a different window. That's what the warning you'll get. So we could do two things. We could demonstrate passing the port command. So we could just pass a different port. We're basically starting up the web server twice on the same site. And we could come over here and we could go to our, so actually let me first show that that works too. So we have one site running there and we could have another site running on a different port. Whoop, uh, two, two, two. Okay, so we have the site running twice. So basically we're, we're downloading, we, we inherited that theme here. Um, this should generally be working. So like the blog, the pagination, everything like that should be all set up. And um, if I were to come here and I want to override something, for instance, I could look at my files here. So we have no content in our base folder, but we could come in here and I could go into my themes folder. And in Big Spring, I could go in here and say, oh, I want the index files here. So I'm gonna come in here and copy this and I'll go to my base folder and I'll basically paste that index.json file in my base folder. And now we're inheriting that content and I could come in here and I could change this. So instead of the homepage saying, let's solve your critical website problems or whatever, we could come in here and just say um, new title and save that. And this should rebuild. And we can come back here and reload this. And we have the new title. Okay, so that's basically how template inheritance and things like that work. Now, um, I know we're, we're already going long on time. I, I have a tendency to just talk a lot, um, but I wanted to show some of the inner workings of some of this stuff. So for instance, right now, and this is about to change, but if you were to look at um, the commands in here, let me just expand this. We're just gonna look at the terminal for a bit. So we have a command when you're serving or building where you can do a Node.js build. So we have this, this end flag or this Node.js flag. So we have two build processes right now. We have one where you're actually using the system-wide Node.js. And then we have another one where we're actually doing everything behind the scenes in V8 directly using Go. Now, the old way we used to build is, is using Node.js. We used to do all the, the builds with Node.js. And you had to have like a certain version of Node.js on your computer. You had to have like Node.js 13 or above in order to use ESM imports. Um, and we no longer require that. And we're actually going to be removing the Node.js build completely in point four, just because as we move forward and we change all the builds and we optimize things, we're really kind of like duplicating all our work and it's, it's slowing us down a little bit. And we wanna have that as efficient as possible. But if you wanted to look at what's going on in terms of understanding how Svelte is being compiled directly, because we're doing this thing where we're, we're actually compiling each component directly. We're not using rollup or Webpack or anything, right? So, so how do you actually compile components if you're not using those? Uh, if you wanted a, a good look at how that is working behind the scenes, you could actually just come in here and you could take a look at our old build process. So there's a an eject command in Plenty, and this basically, we have a whole set of core files that live behind the scenes that we don't want to confuse people with. But if you ever want to eject from the system and override things and take control of things, we give you the option to do it. So for instance, if you were to look at files in here, we do not have an ejected folder in here, right? But if you come in here and you eject those files, I can run plenty eject and I could eject the build file, for instance. So I could come in here, eject the build file. Let me just show you that it gives you some warning. It says, you'll no longer receive updates to this file. We can't guarantee that it'll work. If you edit, you can say yes, okay, that's fine. And if you come over here, now you have an ejected file in your core where you can start messing with things. And we can take a look at this build.js file. So this is the old build, it's pretty simple, but basically what you do is you pull in the compiler directly from Svelte and, um, if you come down here, we have some helpers. So we have things like making sure uh, directories exist. So like for different paths, basically it goes through and it makes folders in case those don't exist. We also do things like inject, injecting strings, like prepending and appending strings to different things if we have to pre-process things. But then we do a client build. And basically what we do is 
we get a bunch of stuff behind the scenes from Go, and then we, we parse it and we basically go through those build strings and we compile each one of these components directly. So this is the API that you'd have to be worried about. Basically, you can run a Svelte compile on those components. And then you can pull out different information from that. So we're pulling out some JS information and we're pulling out some CSS information. And we're setting a couple of things. So we're setting CSS to be false because we don't want all that inline CSS. We actually want to get the CSS and write it to a specific external CSS file. So we write it to a bundle.css file that we include automatically behind the scenes. So you pass that false and then we pass hydratable true. Now this is a nuanced thing that you should be aware of. So if you're trying to hydrate your components, it's kind of interesting. You might be tempted to try to set hydratable true on your server side components. That would be incorrect. You actually want to set them on your client side components. So that's a little gotcha in case you, you're trying to do this on your own. Keep that in mind. And then basically we're writing that stuff to the file system. So we're going through and we're appending all the CSS that we get to the uh, component, or sorry, the bundle.css file. And then we're writing each one of those component files individually. Then we come down here and we do all the server side rendering as well. So basically we're getting the uh, component class uh, constructor here from uh, pulling in the default for each one of those files. We're going through and we're compiling each one of those. We're passing a bunch of props that we've pre-figured out. We actually figure out what the routes are for each one of those individual pages. Those are also the same thing. They're also uh, class constructors that you have to use. And basically we use that in a dynamic component that basically gives you that page routing. So you can go to like your index fi file, your about file, and it has all those pages feeding off the same um, layout structure if you wanted to. So that's how we set all that up. Um, we're coming through here. And then you're, we're doing a render on that component. So once you get an SSR component, so it's like you can get a, you know, obviously like a, a client, they call it a DOM component in Svelte. You can get a DOM component or you can get your SSR component. They're basically a JavaScript file that's like something that your browser can start reading, you know, instead of having the quasi HTML X JavaScript that we're using in Svelte, right? So we're, we're getting those components. And once you have an SSR component, you can run a, me a render method on it, pass in your props. And then basically what that does is it'll create that static HTML for you. And you can pull that out and then, we, you, you know, we're ejecting sorry, injecting a bunch of uh, styles and things like that into it. But that's basically, in a nutshell, how the build works. Of course, we're doing a lot more than that now with our um, our Go builds and our V8 uh, builds. But like, if you wanted to ever get into some of this stuff and take a look at how Svelte's working behind the scenes, this might be a good starting point, um, especially if you're trying to do it without a bundler um, behind the scenes. So uh, definitely take a look at that. That might be helpful to you. I know it's a lot. If anyone has questions, please feel free to stop me. Like I assume people are like somewhat following along, maybe not completely. Um, uh, so that's that's uh, that. Basically, another thing we were doing in here is we were using exec commands before. So this is a Go uh, package that we could use to run third-party scripts. We, we're, we're moving away from that because there's several problems with it. First of all, exec commands are really slow. Um, so we did end up bundling everything you need for your site into one big string that we're pulling apart in this build command because we used to run for each component we used to run that exec command every time and it would have like a half a second de delay for each component so even if you're building that whole thing concurrently it's really slow um so we, we put it all into one thing which was much faster but you still have to worry about things like um uh like if you're using um snap to download that's all in docker containers right so in order to have something that's executing outside of those docker containers so if you're going to the system node.js you basically have to worry about elevated permissions. So they call it classical confinement. Um, if you're using um, uh, Snapcraft, they, you basically have to have elevated permissions called classical confinement. And it, you know it's a whole pain, so we want to move away from that. So basically now we have everything self-contained and it's a lot easier for our project. So um, just keep that in mind if, you, if you're doing exec commands and things like that with Go. Um, I skipped over some of this stuff. I definitely could get into to more information about Netlify builds and base URLs. We have a lot of information about that, both on video and on GitHub. If anyone's interested, uh, you go there. But I know I want to get on to questions and closing this up because I'm going out of time. Um, the last thing I want to just kind of go on here is talking about the V8 build. So the way V8 works, so if you're not familiar with V8, it's basically the uh, the Java, it's a JavaScript engine. It's a uh, part of the, the Chromium project and it's used to run things like Google Chrome uh, JavaScript. It's also used by Node.js and, and Dino and projects like that. So we're actually hitting that directly in our project as well. So it basically allows us to interpret JavaScript. Um, in order to do it, there's a lot of challenges because we basically, we, we lose all the benefits of Node. So like Node, first of all, they have 
common JS syntax where they're, they're using require statements and things like that. And since Svelte is based on compiling things in Node, it's written that way and it doesn't really care about people who are trying to run this in V8 directly. So we have to do a lot of pre-processing of that to, to put things in a way that makes sense. So first of all, we have to write everything into component signatures, which basically allows us to load everything into one giant V8 context uh, while still keeping track of things as individual um, blobs where, where instead of like calling out to different files, we're calling out to different component signatures. So we're doing that. It's the same way that you actually use dynamic components. You call up to those component signatures. And that's the way you're able to use like uh, dynamically loaded async processes synchronously on a build. So that's how that works all in the background. Um, V8 is a little bit of a performance bottleneck. It, I mean, it should be generally fast as the node build would be, but um, just keep in mind that if we're comparing like node builds to, to go builds, that's gonna be slow in general. So um, that, that is something to keep in mind. Like maybe someday we can make that a little faster, but that would require a lot of, uh, a lot of different backend work to do that. We're also using like uh, module uh, MJS or, or ESM imports. So basically, you know, there's the difference between common JS, which is the require syntax to include different files. We're pulling in files with import and export syntax. And basically it works the same way that Snowpack works. If, you're, if you've heard of Snowpack or Skypack, um, instead of using a bundler to bundle everything together, you can basically pull things with the new import set syntax that's um, in the, the new ECMAScript specification. So we actually don't use Snowpack, we use GoPack. It's a, a purpose-built tool that we built in Go to basically do the same thing. Um, essentially what's happening behind the scenes there is it's, uh, it's going and it's um, uh, going through your NPM packages and it's trying to find all those MJS files because MJS files are already uh, ESM ready. And we're just copying those ESM files over and then we're going through your project and we're converting all your Svelte imports, which are probably like, you know, half imports and we're making them fully fledged ESM imports that the browser can read. So we're we're converting all that stuff behind the, behind the scenes. Um, another thing I just wanna to touch upon is like entry points. So uh, our project's kind of interesting because we, we hydrate the whole DOM tree instead of just like the body. So we give you like, take a look in here. Um, actually you can't do this because we did a bare, a bare site, but essentially, you know, you can you can use Svelte all the way from the top level HTML component down to any individual component on the the project. Now, there's a lot of problems with doing this because Svelte's not really designed to do this. So, we have a couple issues open right now talking about different ways to get around this and what the future is going to be for this. I'm, there's a lot of people advising me to uh, probably not do the way we're doing it right now to actually go to the traditional JavaScript route where we create an entry point file and then we mount the body and then we just hydrate the body. Um, now, it's not, I'm, I'm back and forth on whether to do this. I think this would be so much easier for the project, but it, it seems to get away from like the simple static site generator type uh, methodology that I'm going for. So I'm on the fence. I might end up doing that. And what I might end up doing is just like taking the HTML wrapper, putting that in the ejectable core and then having you only worry about like the body experience um, and then like updating the head information and metadata information the way that Svelte wants you to do it. They have this directive called the this felt like head directive. Um, so there's still debate on that. If you feel strongly one way or another, definitely go to this issue in GitHub and, and put your input here and I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what you're saying. I think I'm definitely outnumbered at this point. So at some point I might just have to cave to the crowd and, and, uh, and go that route, but I'm definitely interested in hearing what other people think. Um, yeah, there's so much more that we could talk about, obviously, about how NPM works. So you can use NPM optionally in Spelt if you, or sorry, in Plenty if you want, or you can just choose not to use it and Plenty will handle it for you. Basically, if you wanna update any of this, if you ever get behind on your NPM stuff from an old project, all you have to do is delete your node modules folder and run your build and it should automatically figure that stuff out. Um, or you could take it over with NPM if you wanted to run your own builds, keep that in mind. Uh, there's also a lot of cool things that you can learn if you're doing a Go project about releasing binary. So go release your GitHub action. You know, these are ways you can release different packages. Definitely take a look at that. Um, you can do cool things like bundling versions with it, with uh, using linker flags. Obviously it's more than we can talk about on this call here. So if you're ever interested in that stuff in the future, reach out to me. I love talking about that stuff. Just kind of running out of time here to, to talk about here. So I'll, I'll cut it off at that. I know I kind of jammed a lot in there at the end. Um, if anyone's still on the call and wants to ask any questions, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor to, to basically asking those and I'd happy to discuss any of this either in the context of Plenty or your own projects. Like if you're interested in doing these type of things in your projects, I'm happy to discuss like what you're working on and, and how you wanna do some of this and I can share any insights that, I, that I've figured out through painful experimentation on my own, so.
I'll open the floor up. Good job, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> Jim, I have a question. And sure. I'm not sure if you addressed it. Uh, what made you decide to build your own framework? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, basically, I was looking at a lot of frameworks that, that I really liked. So uh, Hugo was a big inspiration for this, obviously. Um, you know, Gatsby's doing really great things. And I I thought they were all awesome, but they, they weren't quite doing exactly what I wanted. So I waited for a couple of years to basically have someone try to implement this whole kind of like um, idea of making this, the static type generators feel a little bit more like WordPress in a way, like it's still obviously very jam sacky and very different than WordPress, like not running databases, not running runtimes and things like that. But having that experience where you could build something and edit content more similar to that than similar to just writing markdown files on a, a static site generator. Um, so I wanted someone to build that. I just kept waiting for like a couple of years for someone to do it and nobody was really doing it. So I decided at some point I might take a stab at it myself. Um, and it's definitely way more work than I expected it to be. And that's why we're like probably halfway there still. But um, yeah, I just wanted to to basically see if we could get that whole like life cycle experience. And I was really excited about Svelte. And I, at the time, nobody was doing Svelte static site generation besides Sapper who kind of like put it in as like almost like an afterthought it seemed like. So um, I, I, I thought like, okay, well, this is also a big opportunity here. You know, since then there's there's been lots of uh, Svelte static site generators released. Um, so a lot of people were thinking the same thing as me, but at the time, I, I don't think anyone was really doing it that I could find. Um, so I was interested in doing that as well. Thanks for the question. Good answer. Thank you. Yeah, sure. It's definitely, I can tell from your talk that there's a, a lot of tech going in there and a lot of learning and a ton of moving parts coming together. Yeah, it's more, I didn't think I'd have to think about like cross compiling binaries for like C extensions of the Go language. I just didn't think that was anything I would have to worry about. First of all, I didn't know what that meant when I was looking at this at first. And uh, yeah, I had to go kind of deep in a lot of things. So uh, I have a question, Jim. Can sure. you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can. Good. So um, right now, it seems that the data, the content data is coming from uh, JSON files. Yep. Um, and those are static files sitting on the on the uh, so are there plugins to get this uh, content from elsewhere? So yeah, that's definitely the next logical thing. And that's something that I, I wanted to cover. So great, now we get to kind of cover it. So um, yes, that's like getting external API information is something that we need to do. Um, I My original plan was to focus on the like a Git integrated CMS first and then worry about like external APIs. And I'm just, I've I've kind of revised that timeline a little bit because I think I can do some headless type integrations earlier than I can do the Git CMS. So I think in order to make plenty something that people can really start using, like integrating it with Strapi CMS or Ghost CMS or Drupal or WordPress or wherever you want to get your data from, I think we really need a way to get data from external sources. And, I, and I'm actually planning on focusing on that more than I'm focusing on the Git CMS for the short term. So it's not great right now, but that is something that should be coming. Um, basically, I think we have some advantages over other projects because Plenty's data source is completely flexible. So if you look at projects like Hugo, there are defined keys, right? So there's like like title keys and params that, that all work in a certain way. And the Plenty data source is completely flexible. It can be any key structure you want. There's no required, there's like no required keywords. Um, you can put any structure you want. So basically we can get JSON data from anywhere that has a REST endpoint. And then we can copy that down. And then the build process adds all the metadata and everything into it. So it should we should be able to do that in a really flexible way. And then you basically have to build your, your layout structure around whatever data you get. So like if you have a WordPress or it's, let's say Drupal, for instance, because I know that better, like and Drupal wants to spit out data in a certain structure, you can just make your sites based around that data structure. You don't have to massage it at all. You don't have to say like, okay, it's coming in here, we're processing it, and then we're putting it here. You could like literally copy that JSON down and then use plenty around that. So um, so yes, it's not quite there, but it is something that's becoming one of the highest priority things that we're working on. And um, I think we do have a, a good you know, foundation to work on that. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So I don't know if this, I, I tried changing simple things, like um, I changed the content 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't see a hard reload. But sorry, I didn't see a hard reload. But that's okay. I I, I did the refresh on my own and I saw the change. Fine. Um, but of course, as soon as you you start getting into serious amount of content, people will ask for incremental builds and whatnot. Yep. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. So there's a couple things um, that we're working on. Um, so there's um, another contributor who's doing a lot of work in this area. So so Podrick, I don't know if you've seen him in the issue queue, but basically he is working on virtual file system incremental builds right now. Like he like he's putting a ton of effort into making this whole system way faster. So right now, I basically I approach this thing from the context that everything has to go to CI eventually, and since the whole process is is uh, with the the lens of doing the the full build from like CI, like okay, you build a site, you get a site on the front end, you have a, a Git based CMS that lives basically as a a Svelte app on the front end, and that writes back to your your content repository and rebuilds. I basically built the build process fully around a full cold startup build, which is pretty fast if you compare it to other uh, cold startup builds from other projects because there's like no npm installing and a bunch of other stuff that is like super slow. You don't have to install Node.js or other dependencies. You literally can download a scratch container with a binary on it and run it. So that process should be way faster. But like you said, when you're building it locally, if you're doing the full build process, it's it, you know it can be slow when you have a really big page. Like I think when we had 200 and whatever odd pages, it, was, it took like three seconds, right? So with the virtual builds and the incremental builds that Podrick's working on, that should get way faster and you should stop worrying about that as much. Um, and there's also like some concurrency things that we could be doing. So I, I killed concurrency for a while because we were changing the, the build structure so much um, that I, I we used to have like a concurrent build system that was way faster and I, I changed it. Once we get rid of all the Node.js stuff that's kind of hanging out in the background that is like a secondary build that's just duplicating the work, I can move much faster on some of that stuff. So with the 0.4 release, we should be able to go faster. Um, and build some of those that build step even faster than it's building right now. So, so yeah, I think that will get a lot better, um, especially as we move to the virtual file system. Hugo does something similar to this. There's a a project by SPF. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any Steve stuff. He used to actually be really involved in Drupal. He he built a really cool Vim distribution for PHP back in the day. Um, but he he built a virtual file system project that that can help with that. Podrix built his own. Um, so there's lots of like really cool things that that we're doing in that arena. What do you mean by virtual file system? What is like uh, a file system, uh, something that uh, gives this file system API, but is actually getting it from somewhere else? It's yeah. It's, so instead of writing thing, it's all writing in memory. So if you look at Hugo, is a great example of this because they're they're implementing it. Um, so if you run a Hugo serve command, you might be confused because there's no build folder that gets created. So like if you run plenty serve, you get a folder called public that gets created, right? Now you can name that whatever you want, but public automatically gets created. If you run Hugo serve just out of the box, nothing gets created. So you you just be like, well, where the hell is my built assets? Because they don't exist. They they actually exist in memory. There's it's a virtual file system. So instead of reading and writing files to your your computer's file system, it's keeping it in memory and it's serving it all off that. So um, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do when you start just like moving things in memory, and it becomes way faster than than hard re- rewrites to the the system. And also like, so our bottleneck right now is compiling Svelte components, right? So even though we're doing that in V8, um, that, that will get way faster if we do that concurrently as well. So we, none of those, when you're compiling them, they don't need to be aware of each other at first. So you could really just like compile those way faster. Um, so that's something we'll work on as well. But for now, I mean, the build, I still think you'd be hard to find a, a project that has a faster cold startup time. Like when I'm talking, pulling down a container and running CI from scratch, like I feel like it'd be really hard to find one that, that can build pages faster than plenty. But if you can, like, definitely let me know. Um, but in terms of like local development, you're right. It feels slower than it should because it's doing that full process. Is there, um, I mean, should I be seeing HMR in this or not? Seeing HTML? HMR, hot module. Oh, so no, so there's, there's live reload now. With the newest release, live reload works. So if you, you pass the capital L, you'll get live reloading. And what that essentially is doing is it's looking for changes and it's refreshing your browser for you behind the scenes. Hot module reloading where it's actually keeping the state in check is, is just, we don't have it yet. Maybe someday, we just haven't done it yet. I'm making changes to, I'm, I'm making changes to the dot 12 files and I was expecting it to, you know, refresh. Are you passing the live reload flag? Where, where, where do I pass that? 
so there's a flag now that we have to pass. So you can either do hyphen, hyphen, live, hyphen, reload, or just hyphen, capital L. Oh, in, the, in okay, plenty serve, you mean? Sorry, what's that? As as part of plenty uh, serve command? Yeah, let me let me yeah let me show you. Um, let me do a presenting on my screen, and let's let's give this a shot. So okay, so did I delete my stuff yet? Okay, we still have a site here. So okay, let's plenty plenty serve like this. Can you see that down there? So yes. plenty serve with an L. That's that's yeah, yeah, I, I did that. I, yeah, I, I I did that, and it works. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. Yep. So, and I already had a web server running, but yeah, that so that should give you live reloading. Um, it's a new feature, so you know, test it out. Let us know how it's working for you, and uh, someday maybe we'll do hot module reloading. But for now, it's just not there yet. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey Jim, I have a question. Yeah, of course. So when you say that. You re when you remove node that you won't have to update the dependencies using npm install or npm update. Could you just do it? And you're saying that you um, you just do it through your builds? Yeah, so the way it works right now, and I probably should maybe demonstrate this a little bit. Let me, um, let me take a look here. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so can you all see my screen again? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so we, we have our server running. Whoops, let me get out of that. Let me show my files. Okay, so when you start a new planning site, you get these node modules by default. You probably think, well, I didn't I didn't npm install anything. I didn't worry about anything, right? So this is something that Plenty is packaging directly for you. And um, we wanted to give a process to allow you to not, like to take this over if you wanted. So some teams, like for instance, let's say that Plenty falls behind in its version of Svelte. Like we, we prepackage, Svelte with our project on different releases. So when we get when we release a new version of Plenty, we look say, well, what's the current version of Svelte? Should we package a new version of Svelte and we add it to the project? Now, if we ever fall behind for whatever reason, you might want like a new feature in Svelte that we haven't packaged yet. What you could do is you could take over your project and you could run npm yourself. So you could come here and my screen's a little wonky, but you could start, you know, um, if I could get my terminal working, you could do like. NPM install Svelte or whatever. You could run your own NPM and you could start taking over that process. Now, keep in mind that if you start doing your builds on CI and things like that, you have to make sure that your NPM installing, um, so, you're, so you start working off your package.json and your package lock.json file instead of our default build information. Um, so if you wanna take that over, you can take it over. Although, word of caution, because we have all those open issues with like the hydration and things like that, this process, it used to work really well when we had the node-only builds. Now that we're doing a lot of funky things, you will hit some roadblocks right now. So we're hoping to resolve that. But like the theory is, if we could get this working again and we, we get some of the API things worked out, you could take over NPM uh, yourself. You could add whatever NPM package, you could extend it. Like So for instance, you wanted to use like an NPM component library for Svelte, you could install that individually. And then you could start managing NPM completely separate um, with with your uh, your build process there. Now, if you don't want to worry about npm at all, you literally don't have to have npm installed on your computer. And if you ever want to like update these node modules for newer versions of Plenty or whatever, you could just delete this folder, and um, it will automatically get created. So I could come down here. I should be able to delete this whole thing. And if I come down here, for instance, and I run Plenty serve again, it it should create. I think. Well, I might have I might have blown something up. Uh, I I think it should create that that structure automatically all by itself. Um, let me see here. I don't know if it did. Let me go back and see if this is working. Yeah. So it's working. Okay. Yeah. This seems to be working. I don't know why this is, doesn't seem to be looking like it's updated, but um, I don't know if I just have to refresh my thing or whatever. But yeah. Um, so yeah, you basically don't have to you don't have to manage it all. You don't have to like think about it. If that makes sense. Got it. And you said so that you were going to remove that node module file soon or, or eventually at some point? Yeah, so that's all related to right now, you can choose to build the site in two different ways. Like you can just do plenty build, plenty serve, or you could do plenty serve node equals true, node.js equals true. And if you do that, basically what it does is it 
it uses a whole separate build, pro like it's completely separate build process. There's like two that are happening in tandem. Um, and so you could use like, and in that case, if you were to do a node build, you have to have Node.js on your computer. I mean, the advantage of that, and it's kind of cool, I, I'm a little sad about removing it, but for instance, yeah, you could like eject, you could eject and change that, right? So we, we looked at that build file, didn't we earlier? Like um, uh, this build.js file. So for instance, you could say, hey, I don't like how this is building with these parameters or these pro default props. I want to change them and, and pass something else, right? You could come in here in that build file and you could adjust that. Um, of course, you could still do that. Even if we remove this, you can still do that in your route. So like um, we have a, a hidden router. So if you do plenty eject here um, and you go to your router, for instance, um, I can see what I'm doing here. Um, so I just ejected the router file and you could come down here and you can update your router file and you can still adjust default routes and you can adjust like the default 404 behavior and all that stuff. These are all things that I expect people don't ever wanna touch for the most part, so we hide it, but you can always eject that stuff and, and override it. So that's basically what we were offering before. We were offering a way to actually let you override how your build works. And I just think it's it's just probably more headache than it's worth. So we're, we're, we're thinking about just removing it. Got it. Yeah, is it is that clear? I know. It's kind of yeah, yeah. No, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Well, it's not really a question, but more like feedback. Mm -hmm. um, you went into quite some deep, detailed things, <laughs> and I'm. This is my third plenty talk that I'm attending. Yeah. Uh, the third talk given by you on Plenty that I'm attending, and trust me, I still didn't get more than fifty percent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So should I start simpler? You think? I mean, I think um, yeah. Um, you you just need more time. This yeah. needs to be longer. That's all. Yeah, I figure. Yeah, I'm always like, I I really so I didn't really do a dry run on this or anything, as you probably can tell. And I realized halfway through, it's like, this would take like a day to get through this. And I, and I figure people are already starting to get tired of not understanding what I'm talking about. So I really rushed at the end. Um, I would like, I, uh, because I called this behind the scenes, I wanted to talk a little bit more about like how Plenty's built in case other people were interested. Like, like honestly, the sec at least the second half of everything I was talking about, if you just want to use Plenty, you don't have to understand that. You don't have to understand ESM, you don't have to understand bundlers, you don't have to understand V8, it, like that, you don't have to understand Go Releaser. That's all just like for somebody who wants to do something like Plenty. If you don't want to rebuild Plenty or build your own thing, like you can just ignore that part. It's like not necessary at all. Um, I just thought maybe someone would find it interesting. But so, so that's good then to I have a question. Uh, yeah. like, uh, so in terms of contribution, you said there are two people, you and what's the name of the other person? Yeah, Podrick. Project. Okay. Are there a, so, uh, what kind of uh, what kind of help uh, you think uh, you would most welcome at this point? Uh, so, I would love uh, help in lots of ways. So, there's a couple. Like, if you if you're comfortable writing Go and you want to do that, always welcome. Like, we love love to have people contributing that way. Um, I don't expect everybody, especially because we're coming from like a JavaScript angle, might be comfortable hopping in and doing that. You know, if you want to learn, that's great. I'm happy to like teach and, and explain how things are working. So always happy to do that. But there's so many other ways to contribute. So I think the single biggest thing right now is honestly like going. And if you're interested in this or you like it or you just want to help us out, like going and in, starring in the repository because um, there's tons of aggregators out there that are basically ranking different projects by how popular they seem. And uh, and obviously, like, if, if you're not really interested in the user product, we don't need to, like, inflate numbers, you know, arbitrarily. But, like, if you actually are interested and you want to look at this at some point, um, give that a star because it helps us rank higher. And the higher it ranks, the more attention the project gets, which actually helps it in, like, so many ways because you get more people looking at looking for bugs, adding issues, asking questions. Like, all that stuff helps. Like, if you have a question about how something fundamentally works, don't don't sit back and just struggle with it. Like ask a question. Like I love talking about this stuff. So open an issue, tweet at us, uh, 
anything. We're, we're open to questions, opening issues, like any errors you have, because I, you know, half the time I'm only testing, well, not half the time, 99% of the time I'm only testing on Linux, which is probably like a small percentage of people out there. So if you're on Mac or Windows and you're finding bugs, like report those because I don't even know about them half the time. Uh, so Sorry. yeah. Okay. So, oh, thank you. Yes. Um, so yeah, so starring is great. And also like, you know, participants, we actually have, like, so I have a bunch of stick. We just bought stickers. So we have like tons of different stuff here. So um, we got like the, so Stephanie designed, the, oops, these are uh, Perry. This is our, our mascot. We have like the, I don't know which way is upside down, but this is like the, the plenty logo and um, like things like that. So we have a bunch of these stickers we want to give away. I'm trying to figure out a good way to, to give them out. So I, I feel like if someone, let's do participation based. Like if you tweet at us, open an issue, find a bug, write code. If you participate in any sort of way and you want a sticker, just like email us at plentico at janku.com, which I'm sure you probably can't spell any of that. I can put it in the chat. Um, just email us and say, hey, I got involved somehow and I want a sticker and send us your address and we'll, we'll mail you some stickers. Um, so there's that way. Obviously, if you want to donate or write code, that's great. But like that, that's a that's a, a big lift. There's so many things we could do right now, like finding bugs that, or starring the repository that would help out. So yeah, thanks for asking that. Nothing else? <laughs> everybody, <laughs> did I scare everyone off with the uh, <laughs> talking about V8 and uh, Seago and things like no, that? No, no. Actually, <laughs> I was going to say that maybe maybe you should uh, have a, a YouTube live stream or something like that with you and Patrick um, just discussing stuff and explaining and then letting uh, you know audience ask questions. Yeah. Like, you guys going into full oh. by the way I, I have a very very foundational questions in question in go i i went into the repository and mm -hmm. what exactly do i do to st start the readme doesn't say how to compile yep yeah the readme is not oriented for someone who wants to work on the project at all which is something that we should definitely adjust right because there's like there's there's two main perspectives right now for the project right it's like people who want to build the engine and people who want to use the engine. So like the readme right now is oriented to someone who wants to use it, someone who wants to download the already compiled version, create a site, kind of like the stuff we looked at tonight. Um, that's what it's oriented. There's a whole other side, people who want to pull down the project and build and, and uh, there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. In short, you can um, you compile Go by, first of all, you have to install Go. We have some videos on our, our YouTube for showing you how to do that. Um, that can help you out. So. No, excuse me. So if you're interested in that, like uh, the Janku uh, YouTube channel has information on that. But basically, you take your code and you can compile it with a go build command. But the best thing to do is probably just run a go install command. And what that does is it, it automatically compiles your files into a binary that can run. And it automatically puts it in a place on your computer that you can run it. And so like I can basically, like I could change to an old version on my on Plenty on my computer right now, recompile it and run an old version of Plenty. Um, but yeah, essentially it's it's the go go install go build command. You can even go run it if you want. Um, there's a lot of different ways to come at it. I know that's probably not helpful, but like essentially you get go on your computer first, and then the way you do it is you compile the the system into something that like kind of like the same way we're releasing it publicly, and you just run your little compiled version that you installed on your local computer instead of the one that is released into the world. Um, but I. I think you're right. I think doing some live coding on that, it's probably more than we could just talk about in like a short, um, you know, talk on online. So if you're ever interested in some live coding or something, maybe I can do a, a, a live coding thing. We could show how, how it's set up. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I, I thought it would be good, but so I just, I just did that. We'll see how that goes. Cool. Yeah. Let me know how it goes. Um, there's some other weird stuff going on right now. So we're using, um, a generator. So basically Go until very recently had no way to include static files into its comp its compiled version. So like if you have JavaScript files or Svelte files like we have for our scaffolding, there was no way to package that up. So we, we did this thing called a generator where you used to have to run a Go generate command to, to basically include that whole thing into a byte array. Don't worry about that stuff. But basically it's like including all that stuff into a Go file that then could be read and used to um, track files. 
I'm going to be removing all that. So like right now you, you might want to know about that, but like in a week or two, you're probably never gonna have to know about that again because Go now has a way to automatically include static embeds. And so I'm gonna be removing like thousands of lines of code um, to, to make that process easier. So um, that'll be nice. Oh, just uh, FYI, it, it builds just fine. I oh. just had to go, go build. Oh, good, good, yeah. That's great, um, that's great that it, it builds. Um, and you're on a Mac, did you say? Linux. Oh, okay, so yeah, good. Yeah, of course, naturally, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> I wish everyone would just switch to Linux. So yeah, I think this works easier. in Linux, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my favorite story about Linux is, um, it, 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 this thing keeps going on mute. I was saying mm -hmm. that my favorite story is, uh, there was some software, I don't remember, remember what, I think it was uh, Drupal, that mm -hmm. I was running on Windows and it was slower than, I then switched to running a Linux uh, VM in Windows and then running Drupal inside that. <laughs> and that was- Wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always, uh, I always tell people like, you have like an old Windows computer and you're like, you think you need a new one. It's like, you get a brand new computer, just dual boot it with like Linux and it'll feel like a new computer. It's be like twice as fast. Yeah. It'll yeah, stop spying on you as much. This is almost completely uh, off topic, but but I this compu computer that I'm currently on, yeah. I uh, they made it dual boot by, first thing that everybody must know is that you can shrink your disk partition. That's yep. the, a lot of people don't realize that. They think that, oh my God, I have to reinstall Windows now. No, just no, shrink, shrink it. Yeah. Shrink it, mm -hmm. create a new partition and, and do. That's exactly what I do. I, I shrink right. my Windows partition because I use Linux way more, but I, I usually, just in case I ever need a Windows thing, I shrink it way down to like its smallest size. And then I have most of the room for my Linux. I use that every day. But if I ever need to like go onto Windows to like run a game or something like that, then I'll, I'll just go on that small partition and it usually works pretty good. Um, Sorry, but hogging all this time. Sorry. No, yes. no, this is this is the, this is open floor. We can talk about whatever if you want. Also, feel like people have to feel obligated to to stay on and talk about Linux. But like, we can talk about Linux or whatever. I'm I'm open to it. Um, I love that stuff. Our, our YouTube channel is basically centered around all that. We we love Linux and open source stuff. So we we are always Stephanie does a lot of um, Inkscape design tutorials and things like that on there. So if you're into that kind of stuff, like. Come hang out with us there. We should probably do some more live stuff like Jitesh is su suggesting. I feel like that'd be pretty cool. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm personally, again, I, I went on mute hoping that somebody else will jump in, but I have, I mean, I can talk endlessly. Uh, one of the things was <laughs> that I, I picked up Go a long time back, like five plus years back. And then, and I did a little bit of, I even gave a, a talk on um, why you're next in on Drupal Camp, Florida. I gave I gave, I gave a talk uh, why your next CMS should be in Go. I remember that. I've seen yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and um, of course I didn't. It didn't. I didn't do anything with it. I just uh, it was it was just a, a you know fantasy talk. Yeah. Um, but um, so yeah. So when I see this, I I, I feel the itch. Everything's full circle. I feel like you and I have like, we're like, this technology is so broad, right? And I feel like you and I are in this like, it's that's what's also cool about the internet. We can connect with people all over the place. It's just like, we probably would have never met each other if we couldn't just like, be like oh, we, we like Go, Drupal, Svelte. It's like, okay, that's great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like, yeah, I, I have the same journey. Like I, uh, I found Go and I just, it just really made a lot of sense to me. Um, I love like how small the, the footprint of the language is. Like it's really like, so you're, you're missing tons of stuff. Like uh, some people, you know, coming from JavaScript, they love all the syntax, like the, the syntactic sugar and things like that that you can do with JavaScript. And Go has none of that. So like, there's no like filter, reduce, anything like that in Go. Like you have to for loop everything and then like do things yourself. So that annoys people. Sometimes the erring handling annoys people because it's like you're actually check, doing like an if statement on every, um, like, so every function go, you can like return multiple things. So you, you return what you want and you return potentially an error and then you 
you check with an if statement if that error exists and then you log it. I like, I love that. Like, I love that so much. And people probably think I'm crazy, but I just love being explicit. And I love it, it being simple. Like everybody knows, every programmer knows what a for loop and an if statement is. And with Go, you can get back to like not having to know too much more. You don't have to know about inheritance or object oriented programming. Um, you can get most of, first of all, now I'm just getting on my high horse, but you guys can cut me off. But like, you know, there's a whole debate, like, should you be doing composition over inheritance anyways, right? And Go basically forces you to do that. So there's interfaces in Go and you can basically compose things. They have a this this thing called a struct, which if you're familiar with other languages, you might already be familiar with, but if you're coming from like PHP, maybe you're not. It's like an object that um, doesn't have methods. It's, uh, well, I mean, you can still extend it with methods, but the object itself is just like data structure. And it can't inherit from other objects, but you can implement interfaces and things like that on it. And so you end up just like composing everything instead of inheriting it. And like, to me, that just makes so much more sense. Like um, it's just way simpler and, and Go is so easy to read. Like it's, it's confusing in certain ways because I didn't come from like systems or anything like that. I didn't really do any C or anything like that back in the day. So things like, you know, a bunch of like low level stuff, like talking about like runes and in, 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 uh, uh, memory addresses and things like that are kind of they're weird at first, but like once you get over that, like Go is the most readable language I've ever seen. It's for me, it's way easier than JavaScript or PHP or anything. Um, so if people want a simple language with a small footprint, Go is is incredible. Um, I, I'm I'm turning into like such a fanboy for Go. Uh, well, what about like um, so? I mean, I like Go, but uh, the lack of generics caused a lot of a lot. Of yeah, so I think lack of generics is something that is a big problem. So I, again, so this is something that I, I feel like I don't know enough about generics to, to weigh in on this, but like the, the Go community is like split between like people who really want generics and people who thinks it's not necessary. Um, I think generics will be included in a future release coming up probably not in the, the too distant future because they've already like implemented a spec and everything like that. I, I personally have never reached for generics like I, I i didn't have any application where i really really needed it so i've never wanted for it um have you, maybe have you is there any empty interfaces in the in the code base oh i think there might be um i think i might be so i might have done it when i can't remember so i know that's probably not the right thing to do and that i guess that's what you do when you have when you lack generics right you do an empty interface i think i did it when and maybe i've changed it but maybe not um so basically i I reinvented the wheel a ton when I when I was starting this project because I was learning Go and I didn't first of all I didn't know how robust the ecosystem was out there, but um, so I'm using a, a framework called Cobra, which is a CLI framework for Go, and Cobra actually comes with a sister project called Viper, which is like a config reader which handles all your config reading for like YAML and JSON and what and like pulling things out and manipulating them and using them, and I wrote my own reader system, and so like. In order to write my reader, I think what I did is I, I read multi-level JSON in order to pull up things like config files and nested uh, content sources and things like that. And I think there are points in there where I, I allow things to be different structures, right? Like you can be like a either like an array of information or a single string of information. And so I think I do empty those values into an ent empty interface and then I check on them and like figure out what they're doing. So I might do that someplace. Um, I'm sure that's probably like the, the least of my Go development sins. I think um, so, which it's cool now because I have some Go developers who like are, are better than I am, like looking at the code and like, I feel like they're just shaking their heads, but they're fixing things, which is nice. So um, I, I'm learning, you know, I'm learning a lot as I go, but um, yeah, I, I've probably done a few things like that. Yeah, yeah. If, if that's all you can come up with in terms of any empty interfaces, then then you're, you're, you're cool. Yeah, I don't think they're all over the place. I don't, I mean, I don't think they're all over the place, but you might find one or two in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I would like others to jump in. I don't know, everybody else is quiet. <laughs> they're probably just waiting for us to hang up so they can <laughs> go to sleep or whatever, but I mean, I'll keep talking. Seriously, no one has to feel obligated to stay on. You can always hop off if yeah, you want. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I'm going to stick around as long as you, you are there. Uh, yeah. So anybody is there, for that matter. But yeah. Yeah, actually, if 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 no one else has any questions, I'm just going to start asking. 
about about the go code like you know i'm i'm i just uh, did the go build that worked mm-hmm. and uh, that means i i know how it it means it's very easy to compile but how did it pull all the dependencies of the v8 for example how did it do that mm-hmm. uh, in, in the go dart mod yeah so we're using a project called v8 go um which is definitely like really fundamental to some of the stuff we're doing so so v8 go um pre includes the uh the so okay so first of all v8 is written in c++ so if you're familiar if you've looked at v8 before it's not written in go it's c++ right now go has a binding for c based languages called c go so you can pull in something written in in c++ into your go project um and but you have to include c go now there's a project called v8 go that uses c go and it pulls in the v8 uh project and actually also includes a pre-built version for Linux and Mac of, of V8. So like you don't even have to, because if you look at V8 before, you have to do a lot of building of it. Um, but if we pull in V8 Go, we don't have to do that. And V8 Go is incredibly fast. So we, when we were first um, thinking about moving off Node.js, I benchmarked a bunch of projects that are basically um, JavaScript interpreters and AST T uh, builders um, and all these things that I tried to see what was the fastest way we can read some JavaScript from Go, and running it directly in V8 is like like hundreds of times faster than the other things I was trying. So um, that was like a, a big uh, boost right there. And then having V8 Go, which was already doing that stuff without having to to, to pull in that stuff, was like okay, this is a huge win. Now the downside is C Go makes compiling cross uh, platform re- a lot more difficult. So normally you can go build from a Linux computer for Windows or Mac or mobile or whatever really easily without having to think about it. But as soon as you start bringing in Seago, that process becomes like a real big pain. So you have to actually like be really conscious. And like I actually had to write my own uh, little integration. Um, there's this project called OSX Cross, which allows you to build Mac binaries from a Linux computer that has Seago. And I actually built like, an extension for GitHub Actions. So and again, this is getting really deep, but like we're using Go Releaser to, to prepackage all our binary things and put them on different package managers and uh, releasing our, our build images. So we have like that Docker Hub uh, uh, supported build, Im- build image for every release we do. So we're doing that all with Go Releaser. And in order to build like Mac binaries and things like that, I had to grab the OSX cross project, make it so it works cross compiled from Linux to Mac. And then I extended a GitHub action, which is basically GitHub CI runner to, to build that Mac binary. So we got that working again. The Windows build is broken. Um, that, that's a bummer, but I figure you're better off using WSL on, on Windows anyway. So like, okay, you can't you can't use it natively in Windows, but I wouldn't even recommend it. If you have Windows 10, you use WSL, you're gonna be way happier anyway. So um, someday I would like to get the native Windows building just because I don't wanna be, you know, I don't wanna be Windows like, shaming or something like windows is fine it just uh it's like um it's okay it's never, it was never my priority yeah so I, I think um yeah so anyways back to your question uh go go modules is like the new way of uh of handling all the dependencies and if you're coming from something like npm or composer or whatever you're going to be blown away by go modules because it just works so nicely it has checksums built in so like there's a lot less room for people tampering with pre-release things like you know exactly what you're getting um, it kind of works by default behind the scenes. So you never have to like go mod really install. Well, you can go get a new module, right? To add into your project. But anytime, like if you pull down someone else's project, if you run the build, it's automatically going to get those projects for you and, and automatically include that stuff. So it's really, really nice, uh, for a dependency, like management. It does it. I see version numbers in there. So like, so you give the, the URL. So yeah, so if I wanted to include a new pro, like if I was building a project from scratch and I saw somebody had wrote something like that I needed, I could go, I would do a go, what is it, go mod git or go git, I can't remember. Um, and then you, you point to like that GitHub URL and then that'll add it to your go mod file. And then you can start like automatically just importing it in your project. And it, um, and basically the, the uh, go sum is like the checksum. Is it, what is it? Go sum. I'm, I can't remember any of the terms right now. Um, so there's go mod and go sum. Is that the other file? Um, um, that's your, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Here it's called dark sum. Yeah. Yeah. Dark yeah. Sum. So so that's that's like your checksum file. 
Um, and basically, uh, if, if you're downloading someone else's project and you're not adding a new thing, you don't even have to work, like worry about that. As soon as you, you download the GitHub and then you start like building, it's automatically going to get that stuff and you, you wouldn't even have to think about it. The sum file is basically like the lock, the package yeah. lock. It's like the lock file, but it does more than it does more than the standard lock. So lock file will be like, you have this version and it will make mm. sure you get that version. But like if someone were to, and again, like I don't know a ton about this stuff, but I, my, my understanding is if someone were to, and this maybe is not very likely, but if someone was to change the NPM source where you're downing, downloading your NPM module from, like if they were to go to version seven of this router from NPM and they were to put something malicious in there, you wouldn't necessarily know about it. Versus with Go, they have like a real checksum. So they know the exact code. Like if you put an extra space in that version, it will throw the error to you. So you know exactly what you're getting with, with Go modules, um, which is kind of cool. And I don't think very many other package managers are doing that. Um, yeah. Maybe they, maybe they are. Maybe I just don't know anything about package managers. But that was so my understanding. NP, NPM now needs a blockchain. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all getting more. I don't know. The thing is, I never, I never even like, I'm so like when I'm doing PHP development, like composers. So like, it's so apparent that like, that's a tool that I'm using and I'm running right. When I'm doing go development, I never even think about the package manager. First of all, my imports, because uh, I'm using like a, a go extension for VS code and there's a great one for Vim too. Um, like I never even think about imports. I just start using the, the thing and it automatically imports it. Um, but I also like, I, I just don't even think about it because once you have it in the project, it automatically is managed and like you never have to download it or do any work with it. So I don't know. Oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, dive deep into the source code and see, see what it's doing. So sweet. It'll be a good, good. Uh, I mean, it'll be nice to look at some go code after a long time. I, like I said, I, I did some go coding like five years back, almost four yeah. maybe, but uh, I think I haven't dived into Made it go code since then. Well, per well, perfect. This is a good project to do it because we're we're totally open to it. Yeah. Oh, one more thing. There is a, a your Go Mart says uh, Go one point one four. But but I but I built it with Go two, and that was fine. Mm. Yeah. Um. I probably should. So. Yeah, there's been a new release of Go recently too. So you can, um, I don't know. So Go mod tidy is a command that will like remove all the dependencies and things you're not using. It might also update that reference. Like, so I'm not sure if it will, um, but that might show the, the last version that you're building with. Um, I, I can't remember, Go modules were like, there used to be like, I actually started, hmm, I don't know if Plenty was started on this project, but some other project I was using, there used to be a, a like Go didn't have dependency management until like Go, 13 or 14 or something like that. Um, so you used to have to use this other project called DEP. I think it was called. Um, it was like a third party project to do to do dependency management. But like if you're using any of the newer versions of Go, it should just, yeah, it should just be included. Um, but yeah, I don't know how you, you would update that. Maybe Go Mod Tidy will update that reference automatically. Just if I, I'm, I'm looking at your Docker file mm -hmm. and uh, not only it doesn't do two stage build, but it actually uses Ubuntu as the starting image. Like a, the the biggest honking thing you could start with. Yes, there's so there's an there's an issue on GitHub about this. So I I started with Scratch, and then I and then I had problems with the. Uh, I can't remember exactly the problem was. I had some problem with like a standard. I had to do something standard shell import. I think when I'm actually running the binary on the container, and then so I moved to Alpine, which is a much more lean contain uh, image. And I had the same problem. So I just said, at some point I said, I don't have the patience for this right now. I'm going to use a Linux bloated thing. But like, yeah, they should, like that, that image should literally be nothing plus a binary. And then you mm -hmm. have a really, really fast build. But I was getting frustrated. And so I switched it. Um, if we can figure out what's going on with like, you know, it's like one of those things is like, this is not a TTY like shell or whatever the heck that, that error is. And if we can get around that, then I would be more than happy to go back to a lightweight image because okay. yeah, it's cra it's crazy to be running in a boot too. I'll take a look at it. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll see. If, I'll try to replace it with a two-stage build and see if that, or yeah. at least Alpine minimum. Yeah, yeah, like some something like Alpine would be great. 
we could if we could even go smaller that'd be even better um but yeah i yeah it's crazy you're totally right it's crazy right now but i figured well if anyone's gonna be building this for like a an app like we need to give them something so that was like my that was my compromise but um there should be i, I document almost like i didn't in the beginning i spent like probably six months where i didn't document anything but since then like i i put almost like every thought that goes in my head on the issue queue so like there's details about that very issue somewhere and if you want help finding it, let me know and I can do a search and find it and flag it to you. No problem. But yeah, no, I'm excited, Jitesh, I'm excited for you to get involved. Like we could use more contributors. This is awesome. Uh, uh, no, don't, don't talk. get too <laughs> excited because, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I probably will flick out on you, so. Well, I've already I've already assigned like ten issues to, so I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, that's I mean, totally cool. Either way, but happy to have you on board if you want to look. No, hey, no one else has anything to say. Come on, guys. <laughs> I talk to Jim about this all the time. Yeah, so. yeah, Stephanie yeah. <laughs> talks like too much about it. Mm. <laughs> Still a lot of information um, overload for me, but just trying to keep up. <laughs> Yeah, this is a deep one. I feel I feel bad for people who needed to get a first look at it. This is definitely like for a newbies. Yeah, so this good. is like like I I know for myself like if if like a month ago version of me was listening to this talk, I wouldn't even understand. Like I'm learning a lot of these concepts as I go and they're fresh in my mind so they make sense, but like how like there's no way anyone would be expected to know what the heck I'm talking about. So um <laughs> 